My fellow countrymen, Assalamu alaikum. I want your attention to what I am going to say as it vitally affects your future and that of the country. The subject matter of my talk is our future constitution. On the 8th October 1958, I gave a radio talk and made certain solemn promises. God has been kind in enabling me to fulfill most of those. Amongst the remaining, the most important is the one relating to constitution. In this connection, I use the following terms. Let me announce in unequivocal terms that our ultimate aim is to restore democracy, but of the type that people can understand and work. When the time comes, your opinion will be freely asked. But when that, that will be, events alone can tell. Meanwhile, we have to put this mess right and put the country on even keel. Today, I consider myself fortunate to be in a position to say that the Constitution is now ready and I'm going to promulgate it. As you know, a great deal of thought and effort has gone into the collection, examination and formulation of proposals leading to the decisions incorporated in the new Constitution. On the 17th February 1960, the Constitution Commission of Pakistan composed of eminent men from various walks of life, was appointed to advise how best to secure a democracy adaptable to changing circumstances and based on the Islamic principles of justice, equality and tolerance, the consolidation of national unity and a firm and stable system of government. After examining 6,269 replies to its questionnaire, and interviewing 565 persons in both wings of the country, the Commission submitted his report on 6th May 1961. Since its submission, the report has been examined in every possible detail by several committees appointed by the Cabinet and also by the Cabinet as a whole itself. The decisions as finally drafted are the outcome of all these exhaustive examinations and represent as far as humanly possible, the results of mature and honest assessment of the lessons of our past, the experience of last three and a half years, and the requirements of foreseeable future. I am grateful to all those who helped me in evolving this scheme. My special thanks are due to Ex-Chief Justice Mr. Shahabuddin, the Chairman of Constitution Commission, who produced an excellent report which will be published and which served as a working draft. I'm also grateful to Mr. Manzoor Kader, who took infinite pains in helping me in the production of the final draft. I have come across very few people who can surpass the sincerity, integrity, and patriotism of these two. The Constitution is being published in English, Bengali, and Urdu in simple language, and in large numbers for the wide distribution and understanding. People can be expected to defend it only when they understand its meaning and spirit. I hope most of you will acquire copies in due course and study it in full. Here I shall only attempt to give you its outline and salient points. Our aim is to have, have representative institutions based on the will of the people. They shall be the final arbiters of who shall govern them and how. In other words, people shall have the right to hire and fire their rulers. This is basic. There will be a president, a legislature, and a legislature in each province headed by an appointed governor. Their normal term will be five years, but for the coming elections only, their term will be for three years as recommended by the Constitution Commission. They will be elected by an electoral college consisting of the elected members of basic democracies, who in turn will be elected by a universal adult franchise. The judicial power has been vested in the Supreme Court in the center, and the High Courts in the two provinces. There will be only one list of subjects of national character, which will be the exclusive concern of the Centre. All other subjects will be left to the provinces. However, the Centre would be able to legislate for in the provincial field, where matters relating to the security, coordination of economic development, and coordination between the two provinces is involved. Such occasions should be rare. Even in these cases, execution will rest with the provinces. The underlying theme is that what can be done on the provincial basis 
ought to be done on that basis. The principles of policy have been included in the Constitution, and the responsibility of observing them has been placed upon each organ of the state and each individual discharging any function on behalf of the state, so far as they concern him. To enable Muslims to lead life according to the teachings of Islam, to safeguard the rights of the minorities, to promote the interests of backward areas, to attain balanced development of all parts of Pakistan, to observe parity between the two provinces are some of the principles of policy. These principles of policy are by and large substantially the same as the directive principles in the last constitution. Fundamental rights have been made the principles of lawmaking and every care taken that the lawmakers observe them. Since it is in the interest of the country that proper men are elected for the presidentship and the legislature, the state shall give full facilities to candidates to project themselves to the voters and the voters to assess the merits of the candidates. Political parties are banned unless allowed for by an act of National Assembly. In order that Muslims are enabled to lead life in accordance with the teachings of Islam, provision has been made to set up an advisory council of Islamic ideology. This body will consist of eminent men in theology, law, economics, administration, etc., and will be supported by the Islamic Research Center. Whenever in doubt, legislatures and the president will consult this body to make sure that laws conform to the requirements of Islam and observe the fundamentals of lawmaking. Their advice will be made public. The Constitution will be capable of amendment if two-thirds of the National Assembly and the President agree. Three-fourths of majority of the House will override the President's veto unless he refers the matter to a referendum or dissolve the Assembly and seeks re-election himself. This, in brief, is the outline of the Constitution. I shall now touch on each institution. President. The President shall be a Muslim and will be the head of the executive government. He will appoint ministers to help him discharge his duties. Those ministers appointed from the legislature shall resign their seats from the House. The ministers shall, however, have the right of attending the House without the right of vote. To assist the ministers, parliamentary secretaries from amongst the legislature will be appointed. They will retain their membership of the House. The bills passed by the Assembly would require the assent of the President. The President's veto can, however, be overridden by two-third majority of the Assembly. When the Assembly is not in session, the President can make ordinances for not more than six months. These will lapse after six months unless passed by the Assembly as laws. The President can dissolve the Assembly under certain circumstances, in which case he too will have to seek re-election for continuance. The President can be impeached by the Assembly by three-fourths majority for misconduct. He can be similarly removed for physical or mental incapacity. However, to prevent irresponsible moves of this nature, the movers will cease to be members of the National Assembly if they fail to get the support even of one half of the members. In the event of the President becoming a casualty or during his absence from the country or removal, the Speaker of the National Assembly will officiate. A convention will be established that if the President is from West Pakistan, the Speaker will be from East Pakistan and vice versa. The President can be elected only for two terms unless specially permitted by the joint session of the members of the National and Provincial Assemblies. There is also a provision for screening of the presidential candidates by these bodies. Only a limited number will be allowed to contest to ensure that whoever wins the election would be an appropriate person. National Assembly. The National Assembly will consist of 150 general members, 75 from each province. They will be elected by the members of basic democracies. In addition, there will be six women members, three from each province. The electoral college for them will be the provincial assemblies. This has been done to save them having to cover vast constituencies. In addition, women can contest from general states if they so wish. <coughs> the national assembly is the source of law. In order to reduce chances of conflict, 
between the Assembly and the President and to prevent paralysis of the administration and to ensure continuance of ongoing schemes, it has been laid down that previously passed budget shall not be altered without the permission of the President and new taxation shall not be levied without the consent of the National Assembly. This is based on the theory that the President is finally responsible to the country for administration and the members of National Assembly represent the feelings of the people who have to pay taxes. To check misconduct on the part of the members of the House, the Speaker will have the power to refer such cases to Supreme Court for disciplinary action. Because of the sad experience of the political parties in the past and the fact that if allowed to re-emerge today, they cannot be any different to what they were before, and the fact that the martial law has to stay until the National Assembly takes over, the coming elections will be held on the basis of personal merit. The criterion will be the candidate's faith in Pakistan, its ideology, and his known personal conduct and behavior. Would he help in building a united, disciplined, and stable Pakistan or not? To my mind, there can be no criterion better than this to judge a person's worth. Certainly no party manifesto can be better than this. In our case, political party activity only divides and confuses the people further and lays them open to exploitation by the unscrupulous and demagogues. So I believe that if we can run our political politics without the party system, we shall have cause to bless ourselves, though I recognize that like-minded people in the assemblies will group themselves together. That is not serious, but what is dangerous is for these groups to have tentacles in the country. However, should this experiment prove unworkable, which I don't believe, then the party system could be revived only with the permission of the National Assembly. This will ensure that the parties are limited in number and have respectable and healthy national programs. It is sometimes argued that canvassing for candidates, and especially for the presidential candidates, will become difficult without the assistance of party organization. That undoubtedly is a problem, and that's why the Constitution has provided that the state shall assist the candidates for projecting themselves to the Electoral College. Provincial governors. <coughs> they will be appointed by the president and shall be responsible to him for the good government of the provinces in accordance with the constitution. They too will appoint ministers with the concurrence of the president. The relationship of the governors and their ministers with the provincial assemblies will be similar to that obtaining between the president, the, his ministers, and the national assembly. They can appoint parliamentary secretaries as in the center. In order to prevent abuse, the number of parliamentary secretaries, both at the center and provinces, shall not exceed the number of departments. Provincial assemblies. Each assembly shall consist of 150 general members. In the West Pakistan assembly, 40% of the members will be elected from the old Punjab and Bahawalpur, and the remaining 60% from other areas. This arrangement will obtain for 10 years, or two normal election periods. In addition, there will be five women members in each assembly. They will be elected by their respective provincial assembly. Judiciary. The responsibility for ensuring that no law is made which is contrary to the fundamental human rights has been placed upon the lawmakers. Principles have been enunciated for the lawmakers which they are under obligation to observe. The first of these principles is that no law shall be made that is repugnant to Islam. The second is that all citizens shall be treated alike in all respects. There are 15 such principles of lawmaking set out in the Constitution. In case the center or the provincial legislature is in doubt whether a provision in any proposed law is or is not repugnant to Islam or at variance with any other principle, it has been made possible for it to refer the question for advice to a body set up under the Constitution to be called the Advisory Council of Islamic Ideology. A position had thus been brought about under which the function of the courts will be to take notice of and to rectify breaches of the law.